Well, amazing. I said at the uh, the beginning of the service, one of the reasons for uh, shuffling around the tables and chairs and, and making space was because there's uh, we're perpetually getting more and more people. Uh, and then uh, just as I... As our worship began, I was just watching more and more people arrive, and it was great. So it was nice to be able to kind of turn around and say hi to somebody. I imagine there's, there's some people here, actually, that you'd be surprised, uh, that you may know, that you might not know, that you've not seen for an age, or who knows. Uh, so we're in the middle of a sermon series at the moment, and the sermon series is called Jesus Is, and so we've been taking quite a bit of a time looking at the concept of like who Jesus is, and for us to be able to grasp essentially the core values of who Christ is, like why, why, why does it matter? And I think if you look at majority of the worship songs, both uh, modern and hymns, that you notice that it's all based around the worship of Christ. Uh, and so it, it, the, the whole of the concept of Christian means to be a little Christ. And so for us, it's, it's crucial that we keep coming back to this idea of, well, who is Jesus? Who is this, this, this Jesus that we worship? Um, and so whether you've been a Christian for decades or whether you're still kind of on the outside looking in, this is just a, a fabulous sermon series just to uh, remind ourselves or maybe learn something new afresh. Last week, we uh, looked at uh, Jesus is Lord, and I called it Jesus is Lord Part 1. Uh, and today, we're going to be carrying on. Uh, ingenious today is Jesus is Lord Part 2. It's amazing. Um, and uh, so today we're going to be kind of just uh, kind of bouncing off what we looked at last week. So in order for, for us to, to be able to do this, uh, we need to, uh, to kind of do a bit of a recap, take a, 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 a look back at what we've just uh, talked about last week. And then from that, we can then jump into and having a look at what this means for us today. So before we do, I just just want to take a moment just to pray. Uh, this is a, a, there there are there are some sermons that I thoroughly enjoy preaching, and there are some which actually I don't. Uh, and uh, and today is one of those ones that's it's quite meaty, uh, and uh, I imagine many of us are going to go away today feeling a little bit challenged, uh, or maybe feeling a little bit uncomfortable. And that's part and parcel of Christian life, and I'll explain some of that as we go through. But let's just take a, a moment just to, uh, to to just pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for, uh, for what you've been teaching us uh, through your Son. Uh, and Lord, we just ask by the power of your Holy Spirit today that you be in our midst. Lord, that you would help us to be able to see your heart. Uh, Lord, not just uh, for us, but for the way that we view others and how we interact with others. Lord, may we bring your name glory in all areas of our life, how we live uh, how we talk uh, and how we behave. Lord, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So we looked at the idea of Jesus is Lord, and last week we were taking a kind of a peek at this concept that, uh, that from the very beginning of John's gospel, we're told that actually Jesus is nothing new, that he's been throughout the whole Testament, uh, and he starts off right at the very beginning and explaining that Jesus was there as the world was created. Uh, and this idea that actually Jesus is not, it's not a new concept, uh, but actually that this is something um, that, that, that God has been around and that God chose to step out of heaven and into humanity and that we know that as the birth of Jesus. Uh, and what, uh, what John's trying to do is he's trying to explain, and we looked, took a little bit of time looking at this, that um, Christianity isn't a, and you might remember me using this term, polytheistic faith, and that means multiple gods, that it is a monotheistic faith, meaning one God. But that's a stumbling block when you've been throughout the whole of the Old Testament and God over and over again keeps stating that you shall have no other gods except me. And then suddenly there's Jesus and throughout the whole of the New Testament we're told to worship Jesus. And that was a stumbling block for the early church. It's like, well, either I worship God or I worship Jesus. But as soon as I worship the two, I become no longer a monotheistic faith. And actually it goes and grows grates against the very law to which they'd grown up loving. And then there's the constant talk of the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of God. And so this uh, section of, uh, of, of scripture that we took a brief uh, time to look at was to explain that actually God is Jesus and Jesus is God. And we've been, over the last few weeks, taking a look at how uh, Jesus himself makes those statements about himself. 
And so if Jesus is Lord, this is where we went to, then he is Lord of all. He's the God of everything. Which means that actually when Jesus stepped into humanity, uh, choosing to be born as a fragile being and to eventually die on the cross, that was amazing. That was like God's master plan for redeeming humanity. But then we began to look at, well, if that's the case, then why is humanity still broken? And we began to look at, well, why is there earthquakes? You know, why, is, why, why do we die? Why is there disease? You know, why is there brokenness in society? Why is there, and we kind of went through, and so basically this is encapsulated in the concept, if there is a God, why is there suffering? And so a huge chunk of what we looked at last week was the idea that actually we begin to understand why there's suffering when we begin to understand how much God loves us. And the weird answer to the why is there suffering in the world today is because God loves us. And that's a really weird one. And I'm going to just briefly explain that because it needs to make sense before we go any further. Is the idea that in Genesis, right at the very beginning, as God creates the earth, he gives us this ability to choose God. He says, if you, you know, here you, you can do anything in the garden, but you can't do this. And it's that statement of that like, you can choose God. And this is the beauty of what God does is in that moment, he says that actually, I want you to be able to choose me. But in order to choose him, we equally have to be able to choose to not choose him. Does that make sense? And we looked at that idea of, of choice. And as soon as we make that decision to follow God, then we're on this journey with him. He inhabits us and that we're on this journey towards him throughout uh, the, uh, the, the, the time period of, of, of our life here, but then also in the eternity afterwards. However, if we choose to not choose him, then we then begin to choose what we think is, I'm choosing my path, I'm choosing the things that I want. And actually, as we begin to work our way through that, we begin to see that those decisions where as soon as I choose what I want means that chaos happens. And we explained the concept that, you know, if you put a, a child in a room surrounded by toys and say, you can play with all of them, but not that toy, and walk out of the room, within five minutes you come back in again, how many of your kids are likely to be playing with the one toy you said not to? There's something about that, and it's something about humanity that causes us to do just that. And so most of the brokenness in the world around today, most of it, especially within society, is because actually we choose what we want as opposed to choosing what God wants. Uh, and so we then see that knock-on of how, you know, if, if I want what you have, if, I, if I'm going to follow my own desires, then I will take it. And so that knocks its way through. And we've been looking at, even we mentioned it in passing last week, of the, the concept of uh, we're just in the news today, you, you turn it on, Putin wants Ukraine. And so he's taking and, it's, and again, that's just, if you want to see brokenness in its, in its very essence, just look at what's going on there. We're seeing uh, people which are being uh, killed on the streets because one person wants to be able to take back a country and because of what all of that means to him. But actually, if you were to ask majority of the majority of the Russians that are in the country, do they want that to happen? The answer is no. So we can see that the brokenness of humanity through. And we said that we explained this idea, which is a little bit of a stumbling block, but it makes sense, is that God has tied himself to the concept of choice. Because if God comes in and, and, and steps in and, and, and changes one thing, then in, in theory, where does he stop? And so if God steps in and, uh, and literally appeared in, 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 in a physical form in the Ukraine and, and pushed out Russia. Let's go for like, you know, crazy like cinema, cinematography style stuff. Well, then where does he stop? Because, well, there's brokenness on a large scale. Well, then he has to stop brokenness on a small scale, which then means he has to stop it on a minute scale, which means that he steps in and stops us from not choosing him, which means that as soon as he stops us from not choosing him, he takes choice out of the scenario. And whether we want God or not, we are forced into a relationship with him. So God won't step in until the very end. And we're told that in Revelation, how Jesus will return. And with that will come his reign and all knees will bow and all tongues will confess that Jesus is Lord. And again, it comes back to that concept of Jesus being Lord. So Jesus doesn't cease to be powerful. Jesus doesn't cease to have power. He doesn't cease to be Lord just 
because there's brokenness in the world. But God is constantly in the, the, the business of repairing humanity on a minute scale. And that's where you and I come in. Because as we, each of us here, have got a different testimony. We looked at that last week of how we've come to know Jesus. And if we were to take you know, the, the next couple of hours for you to work your way around the room and, and hear different people's stories. You'd be amazed at the different ways that Jesus has stepped into the lives of those of us that are here. So the kind of concept of, of suffering across the whole thing. And the last thing, and I got to the end of the sermon and we went home last, last week and Nick was like, do you know you you've forgot to say something? And I was straight away like, I know what I forgot. And what I forgot to explain was, yes, the concept of choice and brokenness of society works, but, but what about earthquakes? You know, what about disease? What about all of these various different things as well? Well, actually, I think the key to that is actually itself in, uh, in Genesis um, chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse f- uh, 15 to 17. I'm just going to read this for us. So... Uh, in the instructions that that God actually states to um, uh, Adam, he says this, the Lord placed uh, the man in the garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. But the Lord warned him, you may eat freely the fruit of every tree in the garden, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, If you eat its fruit, you will surely die. And there was this kind of promise of the way that life was going to be, that it was God created with this concept of eternity minded. And if the the concept of eternity was there from the very beginning. However, that as soon as we made our choice to choose something that was not him, then that whole concept fractures. And that's what we see. So this concept that you will surely die is a statement that actually death becomes a part of the overall and we know our bodies and our minds are not designed to last you know we know that as we get older our bodies begin to frail uh, get frail and we begin to find that there's more and more problems with it but equally disease enters the world uh, and our earth that was perfect we just know that it's that as the uh, the, the plates shift we end up with volcanic eruptions we only saw that a couple of months ago just uh, in the middle of the ocean uh, to earthquakes which some of us felt only a couple of weeks ago uh, here, actually in Sutton Coalfield. So yes, the the concept of the brokenness of world is is on a, uh, essentially on a, on a human level, on a society level, and on a, across the planets, and we're, we are eagerly awaiting the return of Christ, because in that moment, all of the hurt, all of the pain, all of the disease, all of the, the brokenness of society is all done away with as Christ returns, and we are brought from this into the fullness, which God fully intended in the beginning, where eternity is something that we inhabit forever for those who have chosen to choose him and that was what we looked at last week (sighs) managed to get an entire sermon into just a little bit now it makes sense that I've told you this because this is where we're looking at today so we've got a few bible verses that we're going to look at Uh, and the first one is this concept of Jesus being Lord and what does that actually mean and what does it mean on a personal level so we've looked at it on the colossal side of things I want us to take a look at what that means on the individual and uh, so uh, if you've got your Bibles, turn with us. If not, it's going to be on the screen behind me. And this is the verse that we looked at last week. We're in Romans chapter 10, and I'm reading from verse 9 uh, um, to, yeah, verse 9. I'm in the wrong chapter. I was about to read something it's completely different. I was looking going, this is not what I was expecting. Um, so, If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. I love this, that it starts at a heart level, that this is not just something that I state, but it's something I state outside and it's also something that's going on inside. We talked last week about the idea of baptism as being that we've made an internal decision and then we show it as an external process as we go through the waters of baptism. Beautiful. But this concept of actually stating that Jesus is Lord, this is what the the Bible tells us, this is what it means to be a Christian, that there's that declaration of Jesus being Lord. We use the term Lord and Saviour a lot. 
I use the term Lord and Saviour a lot. Um, and uh, I'm always struck, essentially, by the, the two terms that walk hand in hand. And I think if we're honest, and this is what I'm going to be taking a bit of a look at today, is that many of us, if we're honest, we get the fact that we've made a mess of our lives. Or that our decisions that we've made and the choices that we've made are stuff that has not just hurt us, but it's hurt those around us. That the decisions that we've made have, have hurt our loved ones and that it has most certainly hurt our relationship with God. And that's essentially this concept of choice. And so we know just by looking at our own lives, you don't need me to say you are a sinner because we all get it. Like we all get that we fall short of God's glorious standard. So the concept of needing a savior, like we get that. And so for many of us as the church that actually we've said, yeah, Lord, I, I, want, you to, I want you to come into my life and transform me. This is the thing that we love. But the term Lord is a stumbling block because the term Lord means that actually I place myself under Jesus. And it means that I'm not in charge of my life, but I'm choosing to do what he wants and to choose what he wants of me to do to live the lifestyle that he wants for me to to be somebody who is is bringing glory to his name so uh, this is a concept which honestly across the board um, has, has has been and continues to be a stumbling block why because as soon as things starts to go well in our lives we have a tendency to take back control we have a tendency to kind of put almost say oh lord thanks for uh, thanks for getting me out of that little scary slot back there i'll take back the wheel or i'll place myself back on the throne again and this is something that we find ourselves going through almost in a, a rhythmical pattern and it's that requirement to kind of say actually do you know what God, whether life's good or life's bad, I need you at the helm all the time and choosing to put his decisions above my own. This is something we're going to be taking a little bit of a look at as we go through this. Um, but yeah, I, I love that we started off today looking at Genesis. And uh, I don't know about you, but uh, um, there's, the, in fact, actually, let me, let me step a little bit outside of this. We were at Alpha on uh, Tuesday night, and one of the questions that was raised was actually, I think, a really good question. And the question was, um, if Jesus died on the cross for my sins 2,000 years ago, that was before any of my sins were committed, therefore, how can Jesus have forgiven something, and him dying on the cross was to forgive me of something, if him dying was before my sins. And equally, because I'm human, I'm likely to continue to sin on and off in, as I go through life. How can God's death then be something that forgives me now? I thought that was a wonderful question. Yeah? Wonderful question. Well, to kind of help you with this, and this is something that kind of helps a little bit, is this idea that, that actually... If you were to turn to the very beginning of, of Genesis again, the, the thing that, that from the very moment, if you look at the very first story uh, uh, in, in Genesis chapter 1, and it gets to the end and it says, an evening and, uh, evening and morning passed and there was the end of the first day. And note the first day. So as God began to create, so too he creates time. By the time we get to day four, he decides to split the days and the nights by giving us a sun in the sky and a, and a moon at night. This idea of, of separating time, which again means that before, Jesus, before God did that, there was no time. Does that make sense? Like the, the creation of time began at the beginning of creation. So we have a God that's outside of time. Anybody else kind of want to go back to that moment like I know I would like what would it be like to see God the creator take nothingness and create something like, does anybody else my, my brain just I would love to see what does that look like how did he do it was it done by speech did he physically take something did he do it in his hands does God have hands you know, like all of these questions, they start to go around in my head, like, oh, that'd be amazing. 
But as God does that, he begins and he creates time, which is something that is linear and it goes in one direction only, it goes forwards. I was reading an article a, a few years back about the concept of time travel, and scientists have got no problems at all with time travel, as long as it goes in one direction, forwards. But the concept of being able to go backwards in time is something that scientists can't seem to work out. It's a wonderful concept, and we'd love to do it. I don't know about you, but I would absolutely love to go back in time to specific dates. I really would. I mean, I'd love to go back to, um, I'd love to go back to Genesis and just watch that, you know. Uh, what did it look like, you know, as, as, as all of that happened? I'd love to go back to uh, Moses uh, and the parting of the Red Sea. I mean, that must have been something, do you know what I mean? Or I would have loved to go back to um, Joshua in that moment where he stops the sun as he prays out at that or David and Goliath but if I was honest if I could choose one sort of time period it would be around the, the life of Jesus I really would like to, to be able to, to, to see to hear him teach to be there at the, the birth of Christ as God as we described and the creator you know the one who creates time the one who creates the universes the one who, who creates the stars the all-powerful stepping into a newborn baby, the, the, the ultimate of what it means to be helpless, to, to see that moment, what did that look like? I'd love to see that. I'd love to see Jesus pre-ministry. What was he like as a teenager? Anybody else wondered that? You know, what did he get up to? Because we know that by the time that Jesus arrives on the scene, that he's the sole person responsible for his family. We know that his dad, Joseph, is no longer on the scene. We know this because as Jesus is about to die on the cross, he turns to John, who's not even his sibling, and passes the, the mother rights to John and says, would you look after her, treat her as though she is your mother. So we know that Jesus has got that responsibility because Joseph is no longer on the scene. What was he like when he mourned the death of this man who taught him to be a carpenter. Because we know Jesus to be the carpenter. He learned these skills from his dad. He probably held the business for the family, supported the family. I would love to see what this, this is all stuff we don't know. But I, wouldn't that be awesome to be able to go back and see that? I'd love to be able to sit at his feet as he taught. To, to hear him explain the kingdom of God, for him to talk about God the Father and himself as being one, but in a way that made sense, because no matter how hard I try, I can't come close. What would he be like as Jesus himself spoke about? But then, would I like to be there at the death of Jesus? I guess I'd like to see it, but I know it would break my heart. Absolutely break my heart to know that he chose to do this for me and I'm there at the foot of the cross looking up at him on the cross. I'm not sure I would be able to hold any form of composure. But one of the things that I, I love is that as we see the disciples in John's gospel just at the end of, uh, of, of de Jesus' death and as Jesus is risen from the, de the, the, uh, the grave on, on the Sunday, there's this moment where Jesus appears in their midst and they're afraid. You've got over 120 people squashed into this upper room where they're afraid of the Jews. They've locked the door. They're living in fear. And Jesus comes and stands in their midst. And something happens in that room that changes these people, men and women of fear, to become people who chose to go out and share the gospel knowing many of them would die for their faith. Something shifts. Something changes in that moment where these, these people suddenly become people who are empowered by God to go out. Anybody else like to see in that room as that moment happens? Gosh, that would be something to see. In uh, Matthew's uh, gospel, in uh, Matthew chapter 28, um, uh, Jesus gives what's known as the Great uh, Commission. And in chapter 28, verses 16 to the end, it reads as follows. Then the eleven disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some of them doubted. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them 
in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey the commands I have given you. And be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the ends of the age. There is uh, an issue with the Church of the West. Okay, so as I say this, this is not me pointing fingers at us specifically at Four Oaks Baptist Church. But there is an issue with, with the Church of the West, and that is that over the past century or so, we've begun really good at, at, at getting people to come to church. Uh, over the years, uh, we've managed to almost manipulate the gospel a little bit to make it something that, that stands out to people within the West. And particularly our Western outlook on life is that I am succeeding in life if I've got good health and I've got good wealth. And so that over the past um, century or so, we've, we've began to kind of look at the, the Bible verses which God might suggest that that will come with salvation. Uh, it's not strictly true if we look at actually how Jesus lived. He wasn't wealthy. We're told he has one garment. Uh, he's, he talks about not having a home because he was living an itinerant me- uh, mission as he was going around. Um, so the, the concept of that doesn't necessarily fit, but yet still it's something that sounds like a great selling point. One of the things I would point out is that one of the reasons that, 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 we've, that we're failing as, as the West is that we are great at getting people to make that decision of saviour, but the Lord's thing is still something that actually we're not great at because it doesn't transpose very well. If you were to go to, and I had the, I had the privilege of, uh, of sharing the gospel in Zimbabwe, and uh, working with people who were in literal abject poverty. And as we began to share the gospel of what Jesus had done for them, it made sense And that as they came to know the Lord as their Lord and Savior, there wasn't an expectancy that suddenly that they would be perfect health and that they would be wealthy. Because their mindset was that actually everywhere I look, I see poverty, I see illness, I see sickness. And so we, the, the, the gospel wasn't a get out of jail free, pop you in a bubble and you're going to be perfect. Actually, what they understood it was that through my suffering, Jesus would walk with me and would give me the strength I needed for every day. And this is a powerful gospel. But for us in the West, we're quite comfortable and so the, the kind of putting myself under the lordship means that actually we're doing our best to work our way up the corporate ladder. We're doing our best to be able to, you know, get the, the things that our neighbors have. We're doing our best to work our, our way up in life. And so the idea to kind of say, actually, I'm going to choose to place myself under somebody else kind of jars quite a bit. And coming back to the concept of why I feel that we as the Church of the West is failing is that... If you were to go to majority of churches, and I have this conversation with so many of my peers uh, who lead churches from huge churches, we're talking like seven, eight hundred, to those who have got little churches, that there is a major lack of people who are deeply spiritually mature people. In that, what I mean is, that people that would fit the concept of what, when we talk about deacons and elders, when we talk about elders, like somebody who is prayerful in their decisions to do all things, somebody who's got like a, a decent understanding of scripture, somebody who is compassionate, who's got deep love, uh, and who is somebody who people come to to talk about faith because faith is worn on their sleeves. That actually there's the, the Church of the West has got really good at being able to, to get people to become converts, for want of a better term, to, to come to know God, that's great. But the actual depth of living it out on the day to day is something that actually we've not really pushed. There's uh, been a, uh, so many different um, kind of uh, papers written about the concept of how we fail to disciple our new believers. The people become Christians and it's amazing and they're kind of like brought into the church, but there's depth of spirituality is lost along the route. And so as I talk to most of my peers, both within the Baptist church and outside of that, is that actually the amount of people who they could literally call on to be elders of their church, that that, that, that grouping is small, 
like ridiculously small and that there's such a pressure to try and find people who are deep in spirituality. Now, if you've been a Christian for decades, I'm not pointing a finger. What I'm actually saying is that, that actually if we were to look at ourselves and say, do I consider myself to be of that sort of a person? The likelihood is that we're kind of going to say, well, actually, I want to be, but how well do I know these things? Actually, that's, that's a, quite a statement to each of us. Uh, and this is, again, this is something that I'm not saying is just an issue with us here, but this is, this is something which is a, a, across uh, both America and particularly within uh, the European churches. This is something that, that we seem to have not quite grasped hold of. Yet when I look at that moment when uh, in John's Gospel, as we, as we look to this concept of as, as Jesus fills these disciples with the Holy Spirit, there is a transformation and in the great commission that we just heard, you know, verse 19 says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the, uh, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I think our church historically has been great at that. But verse 20, And teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. I think is something that actually we struggle with. We struggle with. What would it look like if we actually began to obey what God says? You know, in, uh, <clears throat> in John's gospel, like John's, John doesn't pull any punches. I really quite like John's gospel because it's so soaked in the love of Christ. So soaked in the love of Christ. Yet over and over again, there's just a, a, a kind of a concept as, as Jesus is saying, listen, if you want to follow me, there is a contingency to that. There is something that you have to do. And let's just take a look at this. So in John's, John's Gospel, chapter 14, verse 15, and this is one of the many times over and over and over and over again that Jesus says this. He says this, If you love me, obey my commands. If you love me, obey my commands. And over and over again, it's this concept that we've got to obey now, there's, the truth is that there's loads of parts of the Bible and the, the stuff that, that actually God's calling us to do that we'd love to do a pick and mix, you know, and it would be great for us to kind of say, oh, I really like that, but I struggle with that, or I really like that, but I, I don't like that, and for us to choose the parts that we want. And I would say to you, if that's, if that's you, I mean, that's, that's fine, but if we want to grow spiritually, if we want to grow in maturity then actually there is a requirement for us to be believers who actually do what Jesus says. You know, in, 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 uh, in Romans chapter 6 verse, uh, sorry, in Romans chapter 2 uh, verse 23, if you were part of our Bible study on, um, on Thursday, we were taking a, a look at this. Uh, uh, we've got Paul who is writing to the church of Rome and he's in the midst of explaining uh, you know, the, the difference between the Jews and the Gentiles but he kind of goes off on this little bit of a rant where he's talking about how there's a whole load of people who call themselves believers uh, and who uh, go out there proclaiming you know, that, that, that Jesus is Lord proclaiming how great God is and yet that their life doesn't match up with what they're saying. So he says this in verse 23 of chapter 2. You are so proud of knowing the law, but you dishonor God by breaking it. No wonder the scriptures say the Gentiles blaspheme the name of God because of you. This, I always find, is a real stumbling block <laughs> because actually this speaks to us so much. How often does the world look around and desperately trying to find fault with us as Christians. Desperate to be able to call us hypocrites. Desperate to be able to say, you know, there's no truth in what you're saying. Because if they can disprove it, it means they don't have to be challenged by it. And there's such a requirement and a pressure on us as believers to actually live out what God calls us to do. And this is the concept of Lord and Saviour. And, I, you know, we, we, can, we can go on and on and on as we, as we look at actually, you know, what does God say and what kind of lifestyle is he calling us to live. But I would challenge you, if, if you're reading through scripture and you find yourself stumbling, you know, over something and you're like, Lord, I'm not sure I, I grasp this or I'm not sure I understand this. Do you know, 
I've been battling myself over this for, for quite some time. And, and there's, there's so much in Scripture where, you know, I, I, I love the law that God lays down. And there's some part I find myself falling over and kind of saying, Lord, ethically, I really disagree with you on this. Now, listen to me as I say this, right? It's okay for us to do that. It's okay for us to be able to look on and go, but, but looking at the world today, ethically, I disagree with X, Y, and Z. But I choose to say that Jesus is Lord, which means I'm going to obey you in despite of the fact that you say that this isn't right. I've got to say that I trust you in the fact that you know what's best for me. You know what's best for our culture. You know what's best for the church. And I'm going to choose to obey in spite of the fact that actually I might disagree with. And as I read through, and a lot of people are kind of like struggling with that concept, right? But if you read through the Psalms, how often do we hear David kind of coming back to and questioning God, why have you allowed this to happen? Struggling with the concept of, of what's going on in life, but still choosing to acknowledge God as Lord in his life. And I want to challenge us to be believers that do just that. Yes, you see the brokenness around. Yes, you see the difficulties around. Yes, you see that the, the way that God says, that he wants for things to be and you struggle maybe a little bit to grasp it but yet still you're able to take that step back and say but God you are Lord and I'm going to choose to obey you as we walk through this. I don't know what I don't know what your life is like at the moment. I want to just encourage us just to take a moment just to look actually at ourselves on this front. And the concept of Jesus being saviour, we've got this. We understand this. It's something I talk about so much from the front. This idea that actually, listen, we've made a mess and that we need saving, hence the term saviour. But yet over and over again throughout scripture, we're told, told that actually that we're to place ourselves under the lordship of Christ. And I want to just encourage you today to maybe just look at an area of your life that you know that actually that you've chosen to seal off almost and say, God, you can have all of this, but not this. Or an area of your life. I think we're great sometimes uh, at kind of taking our lives and looking at Christ on a pie chart concept. In other words, Here's my life, and here's my Sunday slot. You can have that. Um, oh, I go to a Bible study. You can have that hour there, you know, and, uh, and I'm having a quiet time in my morning. You can have those little slivers of those mornings, but yet the rest of it we hold back for ourselves. But I want to challenge you today and actually say, what would it look like if you gave lordship to Christ to all areas of your life? What would it look like? How can we live a life that actually our friends don't blaspheme the name of Jesus because they see us as being something that counters what they know Christianity to be. I think that's a real challenge. But I just want to just encourage you, just to, as you are at the moment, just to take a moment and, and actually just say between you and God, Lord, I'm coming to you today and, and, I, and I'm choosing to make myself uh, at your uh, disposal to say that actually I'm going to make you the Lord of my life in all areas. Let's just take a, a moment just to do that. In John's Gospel, just after he makes that statement, if you love me, obey my commands, he straight away goes into another piece, straight after it, and it says this, and I will ask the Father who will give you an advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads you into truth and goes on to explain what the Holy Spirit's purpose is. You need to know that actually you're not to do this in your own strength. It's a statement of me saying it, but then allowing God to meet me, allowing God to, to fill us with his Holy Spirit so that we have the strength to be able to do what's ahead of us. God's not calling us to try and do this in our own power. Why? Because you'll fail. But instead, God's calling you to do it in his strength and in his power. 
Heavenly Father, I just thank you for what we've looked at today. And Lord, as we move into our, our final song, Lord, I just ask that you would challenge us. Lord, in this place today, there's still people who are weighing up the concept of you as Savior and equally you as Lord. Yet also in this place now, Lord, there's so many of us who cling to the concept of you being our Savior, but the Lord of all is still a stumbling block. Lord, we can't do this on our own. Lord, we know that every time we attempt to, we make more of a mess than we were before. So God, we invite you now by the power of your Spirit to touch us again afresh, to fill us anew with you. Lord, empower us like you did those disciples. And as they left, different to how they were when you arrived, so too. Lord, we want to be empowered to be agents of change in the world around us. Be our Lord and be our Saviour, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.